mathematicians don't always agree even about some of the most basic definitions used in mathematics. So Thomas Lamb created a survey asking 2,500 mathematicians a hundred math convention questions. And the results are kind of fascinating and get into some really interesting mathematics. I want to begin with the ever controversial zero to the power of zero. You might think mathematicians just have one answer to what zero to the power of zero is, but it turns out they disagree. A little under half say the number is one, but then there's also big groups, about a quarter say indeterminate and about a quarter say undefined. So what is going on here? So what's the controversy to begin with? If I look at something like zero to the power of a, this is clearly zero. Like zero squared would be zero times zero, that's clearly zero. But in contrast, if I look at something like b to the power of zero, this is always equal to one. Here I've graphed b to the x. This is either exponential growth if b is greater than one or exponential decay if b is less than one. But either way, when I zoom in on x equal to zero, I get a height of one. So I've got one argument for why it should be zero, another argument for why it should be one. Which is it? Well, ultimately, the way you answer this probably depends on the discipline of mathematics to which you're being exposed. Let me take the calculus student's perspective first. In calculus, we might say, well, let's look at a function like x to the x. This is a lovely function, and as you can see, as we go towards zero, from the right hand side, this is going to approach the value of 1. And in calculus, the way we'd write this down formally, we'd say that the limit as x goes to 0 from the right is equal to 1. But that's just one function. I could consider all sorts of functions of the type f of x to the power of g of x when f and g were themselves both going to 0. x to the x is one special case, but like here's a completely different special case. How about the base could be e to the negative 1 over x squared. The, the top could be x. By the laws of exponents, I can multiply the x's through. This gives me e to the negative 1 over x. And here's that plot. And as you can see, as x goes to 0, you get the value of 0. And so for this example, we have our limit being equal to 0. So the point is, if I'm going to consider the general context of f to the power of g, where my f is going to a 0 and a limit, and my g is going to a 0 and a limit, the answer could be zero, it could be one, it could be infinity, it could be pi, you can make an example that will be anything that you want. And that's why we say it's indeterminate. If I'm interpreting zero to zero as a sort of limiting process in this calculus sense, then we're going to call it indeterminate, and indeed that's what I teach my calculus students. If you think, well no, I don't want to interpret this problem in this limit sense, I just notice there's these tensions, I might just call it undefined instead of indeterminate. But then why are some people saying the value is one? Well, let's switch context a bit. Do you remember Pascal's triangle? This is the triangle we put ones all the way along, and if I say focus on the pink thing, what I do here is I, I look at the two numbers right above it, one and one, I add those to get two. I can go down, one plus two is three, two plus one is three, one plus three is four, and I can fill out this whole triangle. This is Pascal's triangle. It's a lovely object with all sorts of lovely patterns. One in specific is it's really helpful for expanding binomials. Like, if I take 1 plus x to the power of 5, well, the polynomial that this represents has these coefficients. 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. That shows up directly as this row on Pascal's triangle. And there's a formula for this. The binomial theorem says that 1 plus x to the power of n is a sum of, the way I say this is n choose k. This is the number of ways I can choose k objects from within n items. It can be expressed in terms of factorials and then multiplied by x to the k. So there's this lovely formula for it. And if I look on the left-hand side, I imagine plugging in x equal to zero. There's nothing wrong with plugging x equal to zero on the left-hand side, right? That's just one plus zero to the power of n, one to the n. But on the right-hand side, if I was to plug in x equal to zero, then in the k equal to zero case, I'd have zero to the zero appearing. There's no reason the left-hand side expression should stop making sense at x equal to zero. And so the right-hand side should not stop making sense at zero as well. So in that special case, when I plug in x equal to zero, I should have one is equal to zero to the zero. So the point is this. Defining zero to the zero to be equal to one makes this formula true in all of the cases, and I don't have to have this extra restriction written down, except in the case when x is equal to zero, only then does it not make sense because zero to zero is undefined or indeterminate based on our previous arguments. 
And there's all sorts of places in mathematics where making this choice of zero to the zero equaling one is just really helpful. Ultimately, I don't care what you say, whether you say it's indeterminate, whether you say it's undefined, whether you say it's one, I'm actually not aware of a good argument for why it should be zero, but maybe a couple of people think that. What's more important is to say that in whatever context you might be in, there's a convention within that specific context. And if people aren't sure, you can specify what you mean and then continue. It's not like there's some deep disagreement here about the ideas, it's just what's the definition going to be or not be in our specific context. I'll give you another example. It blows my mind how even this is. The natural numbers are like one, two, three, four, five, and so on. But do they include zero? Well, a little over half of people think, yes, they do include zero. A little under half think, no, they don't include zero. Is it zero, one, two, three, or is it just one, two, three? Honestly, if you've got a new textbook, you kind of just have to go in and look and see how they define the natural numbers if it becomes relevant at some point. Zero has actually a really long and kind of interesting history in all sorts of different cultures. Whether you want to call it natural or not, well, it's led to different historical traditions. If you want to avoid this controversy, you can use things, for example, non-negative integers, that's going to include zero, or you can say positive integers, that's going to start it at one. There's ways to avoid around it, but it's still common, still natural, if you don't mind me saying, to just talk about the naturals, and sometimes people mean that they've got zero in it, and sometimes they don't. I'll give you one argument for why I like to include zero, that's my own personal preference here. If you imagine I'm counting objects, like this is a box with one ball in it, a box with two balls, a box with three balls. If I'm doing this counting, talking about cardinal numbers here, then I also want to refer to, like, how many items are there, what's the size of a box with nothing in it. So it seems very natural to abuse the language here, to think of zero as being a natural number. It's referring to the size of an empty box. Okay, this one might really mess with your mind. Is the function one over x continuous? And it turns out that, well, about a third of people think the answer to that is yes. So the case for not continuous is maybe obvious, just as, well, look at the graph. It, it's got a vertical asymptote, right? Uh, that's not continuous, duh. But let's be a bit more careful. If I go to, say, one of the big calculus textbooks, uh, Thomas's Calculus, a standard book, I use it in my university. It defines a continuous function as one that is continuous at every point, and here's the catch, in its domain. Zero isn't in the domain of one over x. One over zero is not defined. There's no controversy about that. And so if I look at the graph again, in all the spots where it's defined, that is where x is not equal to zero, the function is perfectly continuous. And thus, it is a continuous function. And again, it's, it's not that this really matters so much. These, these conventional differences are not some really important sort of aspect of mathematics. Usually, if there's any ambiguity, people are just going to tell you what they mean. So, so these conventional differences don't mean that people start getting mad and angry at each other. It just means that if you're working through exercises in your calculus checkbooks, well, you have to be a little bit careful about what precisely it was defined in your specific example. Here's another one, also for the, for the calculus students. Uh, is the function f of x equal to 1, which is completely a horizontal line, is that increasing? Again, about a third of people say yes, and, and two-thirds say no. The argument for not increasing, well, it's flat. It's, it's just not going up, right? But, but let's be precise again, but what does increasing mean? So here's the definition going back to Thomas's calculus. It says that the function is increasing if the function value at one point is strictly less than the function value at another point whenever x1 is less than x2. So if you, if you have two inputs and one's less than the other, then the outputs have one being less than the other. A, a sensible notion of increasing. But notice the strict inequality here. f of x1 is less than f of x2. In other sources, like for example, if you go to Wolfram right now, they say less than or equal to here. And so according to Thomas, this is not an increasing function. According to Wolfram, it is an increasing function. People using the, the Wolfram definition would say the Thomas definition is of strictly increasing. So there's increasing and then strictly increasing, the, the special case when it's strictly less than. Note, by the way, that, well, I haven't written it on the screen, both of these definitions are about an interval of points where x1 is less than x2. The standard calculus student error is to confuse the definition of increasing with the derivative at a specific point being positive. Okay, this one's going to annoy people. Uh, is the function 3x plus 1 linear? Oh, okay. 
apparently, again, it keeps on being about one third, two third for so many of these. One third say, no, this is not a linear function. You might be like, what do you mean it's not a linear function? Graph it, it's a line, that's linear. <laughs> What's there to talk about? But there's a really important algebraic notion of linearity, and it goes like this. It says, if I have a function and I take a linear combination, so f of ax plus by, a linear combination, then the output is the linear combination of the outputs. It's a f of x plus b f of y. So this is a lovely algebraic property. And note that this demands that f of zero is zero. So 3x plus one is not linear according to this definition. It doesn't go through the origin. And the terminology that you might use here is that something like 3x, which does go through the origin and does satisfy this property is linear. And then 3x plus one, which is sort of like linear, but then shifted is an affine transformation. In the subject of linear algebra, we really study this algebraic property in a lot of detail. We can generalize this, for example, to a higher number of dimensions and talk about linear transformations of a plane or three-dimensional space. There's a lot of really lovely work and primarily you're focused on that concept where it's linear and not affine. This next one is not just about basic conventions. It actually gets to some deeper issues within mathematics and this is the axiom of choice. And in the axiomatic foundations of mathematics, and there's multiple different ways to do this, the, the axiom of choice is an axiom that most mathematicians tend to accept. As you can see here, it's about 85%. And then the rest have some combination of either rejecting it entirely, or maybe they reject the axiom of choice, but they accept a weaker notion. For example, the axiom of countable choice, the axiom of dependable choice is another option that's not here in the particular poll. But the point is most people accept it. Okay, so, so what is the axiom of choice? I imagine I've got like a bag, it's got a bunch of marbles inside of it. And then I have another bag with another bunch of marbles, another bag, another bag. And then I want to imagine that this goes on to infinity. If I only have a finite number of bags, it's very easy to say, well, I can pick one marble from the first, one marble from the second, and one marble from the third. But if I have infinitely many, can I keep on doing that association with infinitely many bags? Is there a way to come up with a choice function that picks one marble out of every single one of these bags? That you can do this is called the axiom of choice. This is often paired together with other axioms in something called zermelo franklin set theory, which is one of the sort of foundations of mathematics. And this may be intuitive, maybe not. Maybe you tempted to agree that this is obvious. Maybe you're tempted to say, no, it's not obvious. People do genuinely disagree about it. And the types of mathematics that you get, unlike these previous just definitional disagreements, the actual mathematics that you get really changes depending on whether you do or do not reject the axiom of choice. Now the final one I'm gonna leave you with here, I have shared my thoughts to like a half billion of you before in a video is the ever viral six divided by two, uh, three plus one. And well, well, I'll just uh, show the results here and, and I'll let you make your own conclusions about what the average mathematician thinks of this problem. Now, if you're interested not just in worrying about silly math conventions, but actually learning mathematics, then I'd strongly encourage you to check out the sponsor of today's video, which is brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of lessons across mathematics, computer science, AI, and more. And Brilliant helps you learn by doing. All of their lessons are delightfully interactive so that you are the one in the driver's seat actually doing the math. It builds up complexity in layers so you can be confident with your understanding on one step before you're jumping on to the next one. And it is constantly providing feedback and opportunities to self-assess. One of the big challenges that I had to deal with both as a math YouTuber and as a professor is students who try to learn a lot of math just by watching a lot of videos, which can be great. But if you're not actually doing the mathematics, it's really hard to learn it deeply. And so I really appreciate the approach that Brilliant takes to learning. And that's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazet or click the link down in the description. And clicking that link will give you an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have your own little math controversies, lay them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.